Oh, hey, this is Ash. Uh, I've got a real treat for you today. I'm going to be talking about building a resilient stream processor in Go. The project is called Benthos, and if any of this tickles your fancy, then maybe go check it out, give it a cheeky gander. So I work for a company called Meltwater where we have a ton of streaming pipelines, and they all do different kinds of things. The platform is vast, and we have this common issue where we'd like to reuse a component that already exists in some sort of pipeline by linking it with another pipeline, but they use different queue systems or protocols for whatever reason. And there's a maybe a reason why we can't change that. Um, and rather than deploying the same component multiple times and having multiple pipelines to maintain, um, we'd like to just bridge the gap and just have one combined stream. Another problem we've got is that sometimes the pipelines that we want to link together are such that if a component downstream of the existing pipeline um, comes offline for whatever reason, it applies back pressure, and the thing that we want to link it to would suffer from that. So this could be a fire hose, for example, where if you get back pressure, then maybe you get data loss, in which case our bridge ideally would also have some sort of buffer. And that would just give us a little bit of wiggle room. Um, and we, we want to make this config-driven, so we wouldn't necessarily want a buffer all the time, because a lot of the time we just don't need it, and just be there as an option. Um, another issue we've got is that sometimes the pipelines we're linking together don't look the same, so the, pipe, the um, payloads are different. And that could be stuff like archiving, compression, encoding. It could just be differences in the JSON document format, in which case we'd also like to be able to specify a configuration list of steps that we want to perform, which would just be common streaming operations um, in order to translate a payload from one pipeline so that it looks like it's come from another pipeline. And that way these services don't need changing. They can just work on the same sort of payloads that they were used to. Um, and finally, a big deal is resiliency for us. So um, a lot of the time we're using um, resilient queues and the components that we have in a pipeline all have to behave such that they are never the weakest link in terms of resiliency of that pipeline. And what I mean by that is, so a common approach when writing a service that reads a stream of data and then writes a stream of data, um, <clears throat> say you've got some complex pipelining where you want to distribute the work across lots of threads, what tends to happen is you'll have an internal buffer somewhere and that's where you store messages, you'll immediately acknowledge or commit the offsets of messages that you've read, um, you do a bunch of stuff to it while it's in your buffer and then you send it on. And the problem with that is buffers are not particularly resilient. So um, it could be a memory buffer where it dies if you restart it, but then also even if this is a disk buffer, it could become corrupt, it could get lost, somebody could come and steal it and run away on a boat. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that can happen to disk, to disk buffers. And a lot of the existing solutions that do the kind of things I'm describing here work some way like this because it's just easy to architect a service this way. Whereas what all of our components do is um, we try to make it so that it reads a message, does a whole bunch of stuff, could be as complicated as you want it to be, the pipelines could be as sophisticated as you need, but the idea is that uh, offsets are never committed or acknowledgements are never sent for messages um, until that message has actually left the service already. So if you're bridging, say, a Kafka um, topic to another Kafka topic, then using this method means that it doesn't matter what happens to a payload while it's in the service, the service could crash, the, um, the server could die, it doesn't matter because as long as your offset isn't committed until you've confirmed it's reached the next Kafka queue, then messages are as resilient and safe as the protocols you're using. So you would have the full resiliency guarantees of Kafka um, and that could include replication, uh, whatever. The point is this service isn't the weakest link and this bridge that we're proposing here should follow those same rule sets. And that's what really would set it apart from a lot of the um, alternatives. And that's what started me on this journey to building Benthos. So let's take a look at the uh, first attempt. So it was called the first attempt because it was eventually replaced with the second attempt. So let's just take a brief look at what it was and why it failed miserably and why it's now dead. So the idea was to have these layers, uh, which are all pluggable, and that would allow you to have different input sources and different output sinks. Um, and it would all be configuration driven. And each layer is at least one Go routine. And the idea is that it sends communications via channels, um, all standard Go stuff. Um, and I came up with these two interfaces. So a producer is something that creates messages somehow and sends them to something else. And a consumer consumes messages and then gives back a response. Now a message type would just be a collection of payloads and it can have multiples. So the idea is that you can mix and match multi-part message protocols with single part message protocols. Every component within Benthos is able to work with multiple parts. And I also decided to make batches synonymous with multi-part messages. And I give you a general tool set in the service for creating batches, making them bigger, and also contracting them, making them smaller. And that gives you just a general tool set for 
uh, mix and matching multi-part with single part protocols and batching um, however you want. I also came up with a response type, which is usually just a, it's a Boolean, essentially. It's either an acknowledgement or it isn't, but it can also carry um, other contexts as to you know why it's not an acknowledgement or stuff like that, which might be useful for certain components. Um, and yeah, so a producer um, owns its message channel and a consumer owns its response channel. And this would allow you to also combine inputs and outputs. So the idea is that a layer just supports this producer interface and then itself could contain um, a number of components that are all uh, essentially the same interface and it can just combine them in some sort of brokering pattern and it will work the same in output layers and any other layer that you've plugged into Benthos um, and it all works the same. So a broker would be reading from all of these um, in parallel and then it would be sending messages down the message channel and then the output layer might be routing these to different outputs, um, depends on your config. And then you could also slot layers in. So if a um, component implements both the producer and consumer interfaces, then that means you can just slot it in between any of the layers and that could all just be done dynamically. Um, and what would happen is, so with a buffer layer, for example, it would be reading and then responding to the producer layer it's reading from in parallel and that would be one loop. And then it would also have another layer, um, another loop going on where it's reading messages from its buffer, sending them to the output layer and then removing them if the response acknowledges the message. But you could also have some hypothetical bridging layer here, which could be doing some processing, for example, and it could just read a message, do something, send it onto the output, get the response back, and then send the response back to the original producer. Um, and this is what the interfaces look like, so I won't dwell on this too much because it's dead. But um, it was quite simple. So producer just has a function to return back the message channel, and then you can tell it to start producing by giving it a response channel. The consumer is the exact opposite, and some hypothetical function to link the two would look a little bit like this. Um, and there's a lot of stuff I like. So um, it was quite a straightforward interface. It was easy to implement and it was easy to guarantee that things were relatively safe because any component that's writing on a channel owns that channel. Um, it satisfied our use cases. So we used this in production for more than a year, usually just doing simple bridging, a um, little bit of processing here and there. Um, it was very high throughput, low latency, which is what we needed. Um, I won't go into numbers because it's kind of meaningless here because you can do so many different things. It would depend on what you're doing with it, but you know, hundreds of thousands of messages, less than one millisecond latency, just ballpark. Um, and yeah, I like the fact that layers had ownership of the channels they're writing to. And also there was an idiomatic signal from components upstream to tell components downstream that they'd ended. So for example, if the standard in uh, input runs out or gets closed or whatever, then the input layer can close its message channel. And that basically tells the buffer listen, you're not going to get any more messages from me, okay? And then what the buffer can do is it can say, okay, that's fair enough, fair play, mate, but, you know, I've got some messages in my buffer left, so I'm just going to drain that. And what it can do is it can gradually flush the messages in its buffer, and then once the buffer's empty, it can then close, giving a signal to the output layer of, listen, mate, you freeloading output, you're not going to get any more messages from me. And then what the output can do is it can say, well, okay, my life has no meaning anymore. I guess I'll shut down as well. And then what you can do is, as the orchestrator of these components writing some service that wraps them, um, is you can just watch on the output layer to see when it closes. And if that happens, then that's basically a signal that the pipeline has gracefully come to a halt. And then you can react to that appropriately. So that could be, you know, you shut down the service or it could be, you know, you restart it or whatever. It's completely up to you. Um, however, it did have its problems. So um, it was great for the most part, but there were some like weird quirks. So, I mean, if you're doing something like a single output to fan out, everything was fine. If you're doing fan in to fan out, that was fine. If you're doing fan in to round robin, suddenly you saw this weird issue where what you'd like is for every parallel input. So say each of these inputs is reading from a Kafka partition. Um, and we're writing out to some HTTP server with these HTTP connections. If we have multiple HTTP connections going on and we have multiple input uh, consumers, then what you'd naturally want is if we're round robining the messages to different outputs, they should all be going at the same time. If we've got four inputs, four outputs, then each input should always be giving a message to an output and the output should therefore be fully utilized. But the problem is with this bridge, you couldn't do that because it's effectively working in lockstep. We send a message over the channel and then we wait for a response back. So if the broker looking after these um, producer interfaces here, it's not gonna know how to route a response back to one of these unless it's only sent one message at a time. 
Um, so we just get this odd lockstep where most of the inputs are going to be blocked and most of the outputs are going to be idle. If we were to hypothetically send four messages over, for example, and we start getting responses back, well, because they could come in any order, we don't know which input to route them to. So, oof, awkward. That was a bit of an issue. Um, I mean, it was fine. Like, we didn't actually ever get hit by this, but it was just one of these, like, mm, okay, that would be an issue if we ever wanted to do that and get max throughput. Um, another problem is, um, so we have this concept of processors, which sometimes is a fairly CPU heavy operation. Now, originally, I didn't really anticipate adding many processors. I just thought these would be like trivial small things and we it would be kind of niche. But then as things went on, they started becoming really useful and really powerful and we started wanting to use them more. Now, if you wanted to vertically scale your processors, say they're very CPU heavy, what you could do is you could attach your processors to a specific input and you could have multiple inputs. So say we're reading from Kafka partitions, we can split the um, the vertically scaled threads, uh, each consuming some partitions. And that was fine. Um, however, in a hypothetical situation where we've got multiple parallel consumers, but that surpasses the number of processing threads we've got, it might be nice to have, instead of our processors associated with a particular input, um, to have them in their own layer where we can have an explicit number of processing threads and that would lock it to the number of CPUs so we don't get as much contention. We couldn't do that with this bridge because for the same reason, uh, we would only be ever sending one message at a time over that um, message bus uh, and then we'd have to wait for a response back. So even if we've got these multiple processors, they would mostly be idle because we're only ever hitting one of these at a time. So again, like this didn't really hit us that much originally, but I could see that as our use of this was increasing, eventually it would have gotten to the point where um, it would have limited the way that we were using it. And I didn't want that to be the case. Um, I did quite like this interface, but you know, things change, things evolve. I was quite happy that, you know, I built this thing and we were getting some good use out of it, but ultimately I decided to refactor the whole thing. So the second attempt. So most of the components I'd already built by this point could just stay the same. So for example, brokers and individual consumers and sinks, um, all of those components could stay the same. All I really needed to change was the way that the uh, the layers were communicating with each other. So I decided to scrap the two channels mechanism and now just have one channel. And this was going to be called the transaction channel. And a transaction is um, a structure that contains both a message payload and also a response channel. And the idea is that whatever creates a transaction owns the response channel. And that gives any component within a pipeline the mechanism by which it can give the response directly back to the original source of the message. And it's just a nice clean implementation. It means we don't have to do any complex routing or anything like that. Um, it's just a channel. Um, so you can do all your original select statements or whatever you were doing before. Um, and the idea is that producers own a transaction channel now, and therefore by proxy, they also own the response channels that are going through the pipeline. And the idea is here, so imagine we're doing our um, fan into round robin setup like before. Well, now what could happen is any of these um, parallel uh, inputs could get a message, send it down the transaction channel. It then could get routed to one of these outputs by the output broker. and every component that's just done that is now free to do that again whilst that message is still in transit. And then what happens is when one of these outputs gets an acknowledgement back from its protocol, um, just confirming that the message has ended up at the correct destination, it can then independently send that response directly back to the source, um, which then also sends its acknowledgement back to its protocol. And that can happen completely separate to the uh, communication bus. And then obviously if you slot in uh, more layers, it frees them up. So you imagine we've got um, multiple inputs all working in parallel, then we have fewer processors than we have inputs, and then we have more outputs than we have processors. This is the kind of setup that used to um, have a lot of idle or block components before. Well, what would happen now is any of these um, parallel inputs gets a message, sends it down the transaction bus. If there's a processor that's free and it's not currently busy, it's able to grab that and then once it's done its processing, it can either send it down the bus or if it's done something like filtering, for example, it might remove the message, in which case it's going to send an acknowledgement directly back to the source. 
But then as soon as that's free, it's ready to just grab the next one. It doesn't have to wait for that message. It's just sent to be acknowledged um, because it doesn't care about that anymore. Uh, once it's sent a message down that transaction bus, it no longer cares what happens to it. Um, and then what happens is eventually the messages will get routed to an output and like before it'll get sent over a protocol we get an acknowledgement back and then the acknowledgement gets propagated all the way back to the original input which then propagates it back onto its respective protocol and um, so the i mean the, the the ultimate goal of a pipeline like this uh, where we've got these processors which are going to be um, locked to a cpu uh, what we want is for these processors to be hot we want them to be hitting 100 percent utilization and that means that our inputs are running um, to meet the capacity of these processes and the outputs also at, um, meeting the capacity of these processes. And really, that's how you get the most out of it, because you can't you can't do more processing than you have CPU. Um, so this is this is kind of like the ideal pipeline. Um, and within Benthos, you could set the number of parallel inputs and you could increase that if it turns out that the input is the bottleneck and you could do the same with the output if that turns out to be the bottleneck. And then obviously you keep your processes locked to a specific fixed resource. Um, and another thing you could do is obviously you can stick these buffer layers in. So um, I didn't mention this in the previous section, but obviously if you stick a buffer somewhere in your pipeline, you've effectively decoupled the um, acknowledgement propagation. And the way that that works here with the transaction bus is, is the same essentially. So transactions come down to the buffer, the buffer sticks the message in its buffer and then sends a response back to say that that's happened and we get this immediate loop um, of messages. And then what happens is we have this completely independent loop going on here where messages are getting popped from the buffer, sent all the way down, same as uh, previous slide, and then they get routed back um, independently of these transaction buses. And this is what the interfaces look like. So they're a lot simpler now. Um, we've just got a producer interface which returns a transaction channel and we've got a consumer interface that consumes a transaction channel. Um, and then your hypothetical function to link them shouldn't even exist anymore because it's just one line. Uh, very, very simple. And there's a lot of stuff I like. So obviously this satisfied more use cases. Um, we were now able to just deploy a single instance of Benthos um, to get the most out of a machine's resources, no matter what the configuration. Whereas before we would have been limited to certain brokering patterns to do something like that. Um, so yeah, I was happy. Um, we also managed to retain the idiomatic shutting down mechanism. So because the transaction channel is owned by components upstream, obviously that means we can still do the closing down um, routine just like before. Um, it also means that if your service, when it closes down, what it can do is it can just tell the input layer to shut itself down. It then triggers this whole process of flushing the buffers out and then eventually the output layer closes. And that way we know when we're shutting down gracefully um, the, the pipeline has flushed any messages potentially but obviously you cap a timer on that because you don't want to wait for it ever so uh, it's completely up to you. Um, obviously there's caveats so because we're doing channel of channels there's no real um, guarantee that uh, obviously things that are writing on a channel don't own the channel anymore so um, the only way to guarantee that components aren't going to write on a closed channel is to just never close the channel. So that's just a general rule in Benthos. Nothing ever closes a response channel. And it kind of sucks that you can't enforce that through the API, but, you know, swings and roundabouts. Um, I don't care, quite frankly. Um, and this is what an input implementation looks like. So uh, you imagine this is um, the code within Benthos that is um, running on a go routine and what it's doing is it's reading messages from a queue system and this could be kafka amqp it could be nsq nats all that kind of stuff um so this is obviously pseudocode and it also misses out things like logging and metrics which is quite important but you imagine we make a responses channel and then what we do is we just enter this um forever loop where we read a new message from the queue system obviously if that gives gives us back an error we'll expose that somehow and then just do the loop again um there'll be some like um logic for sleeping on consecutive um, read attempts, stuff like that. Um, and then what we do is we enter the select statement where we try and create a new uh, transaction that gets sent over the transaction channel. That comes with the message we just read and also the responses channel that we own. Um, and we also have this uh, case here where if the entire service is closing down and we get this close signal by closing this channel, um, we'll exit immediately, which is fine. Um, and then we enter another select statement. So we've sent a transaction down and then what we do is we wait for the response. And as soon as we get a response, what we do is we call um, an acknowledge function on our queue 
um, which again is just a hypothetical. And what we do is we give back a Boolean to say whether or not it's an actual acknowledgement. So this could be, um, imagine if we're AMQP, this could be telling the AMQP protocol to either um, acknowledge the message and say that we've claimed it and it's done, or it could be a NOAC, in which case we're saying, maybe you should route this to another service because we failed to do anything with it. Um, obviously, if this was something like Kafka, um, because an acknowledgement is basically committing an offset, you don't really have a concept of a NOAC. So what we might do in that case is rather than sending something on the queue or whatever, we just try the same message over and over again. And we'd have like obviously a delay between doing that and we'd expose the fact that we're retrying it. Um, and also we give some mechanisms for, um, for coming out of loops where we're just trying the same message forever. Um, and this is what an output might look like. So uh, similarly, we... Um, this is all going to be pseudocode with no metrics or logging, but we do um, a select statement here where we're reading from a transactions channel. We assign a transaction and um, also an open flag just to check that the channel has been closed. If it has been closed, then that means the component we're reading from is over and therefore we might as well exit. Same if we hit our close chance, if the service has told us to shut down, we'll also return immediately. Um, and then once we've read a transaction, assuming that's happened, what we can do is we can try and write it to our respective queue and we give it the payload of the transaction and this will return an error maybe and obviously depends on the library but if it does return an error we can wrap it in this response um, error type so what this does is this creates a response from an error so obviously if the error is nil then it's an ACK um, but if the error is non-nil not only does it give back a no ACK um, all the way back to the original um, message creator but that no ACK also contains the error message context which might be used by something and it's just a little bit of extra info. Um, and then obviously if we get a closed signal while we're waiting for this response to come back, or rather while we're waiting for the response to be sent over the response channel, sorry, um, then we'll exit immediately. <coughs> um, so let's have a look at some brokers because brokers are fun, aren't they? Cheeky little brokers. Um, so Fanin Broker, let's start with that. Um, so a Fanin Broker in Benthos has a collection of inputs that it owns, and each of these inputs is uh, basically a go routine, um, running independently, consuming messages continuously, and then writing them on a transaction channel. And then what the broker does is the broker spawns another go routine that manages that um, input source. And what it's doing is it's continuously reading transactions um, from the input and then writing those on this shared transaction channel. Um, and that's it. It just does that in a loop. And then what we do is we have another go routine that's independent of all the other inputs. And this one just keeps check on which inputs are alive. And then what happens is whenever um, one of these green threads um, notices that the transaction channel of the input that it's managing has closed and therefore the input has ended, uh, what it does is it sends a signal to this um, independent Go routine just to say, hey, my input is now dead. Um, what are you going to do about it, mate? Um, and what happens is when all of these inputs have closed, it then says, okay, well, there's no point keeping our transaction channel alive. We'll cut that off, and then we come to a halt. We clean up all of our resources. And that means that you still preserve the graceful termination of um, pipelines, even under these brokers. And when the broker has sent a message down its shared transaction channel, it doesn't have to worry about it anymore because the response is going to get routed back to the individual um, input. Um, and it's as simple as that. So this is some of the code. So um, this is a little snippet of... Uh, what's going on inside the go routines that are looking after an individual input. So what happens is we reference the inputs as by their index, the inputs is, um, and then what it does is it will continuously read from its transaction channel. And when this loop ends, the transaction has, channel has been closed. And then we send our index over this in the input closed channel. And this is how we signal to the, um, the other go routine that we've ended. And then obviously this go routine cleans up. And this is the separate one. So this is the independent Go routine that's um, churning away in the background. And what it's doing is it's iterating this map of our inputs. Um, and then every time we get a signal saying that an input is closed, it deletes it from the map. And then when the map is empty, we close our um, signal channel. And then we also close our transaction channel. And then we exit completely. Um, and we completely clean up all of our resources. Um, fan out brokers are also fairly straightforward. So um, we read a transaction and then what we do is um, on a single Go routine, we only need one for this broker, um, we create, so what we do is we create a new transaction channel and a response channel for every output that we own. 
and for every transaction that comes through we clone the transaction and we put the we clone it for every output and we put its so a response channel per output onto the transaction that we've cloned uh, and then we send that over the transaction channel for each output and we do that in parallel so every output receives a transaction at the same time and then what we do is we wait for responses to come back on each output's respective response channel um, and what happens is if we get back an acknowledgement from a response that's bad, uh, yeah, from a response that's bad, so say like um, we failed to send the HTTP request here, well, uh, with the fan out broker, we apply back pressure if any of these outputs block. So uh, that would count as basically blocking, and what we do is we retry. Um, so every output that has failed on an attempt gets retried in this loop, and it looks a little bit like this. So obviously this is pseudocode, it's missing a whack load of stuff, um, but we for every mess for every transaction that comes in we enter this loop and we create a slice of output targets so that's a list of indexes and we go through that list uh, which starts off as every output and we send a new transaction with the outputs respective response channel um, to its transaction channel and then what we do is we create a new slice of targets and we iterate all of the output targets again get an, a response back from the output and if the response is no good so it's failed for whatever reason we append that particular index onto our new target slice and assign it to the outer output target slice and then we enter this loop again so we basically narrow that slice down until eventually we've um, successfully sent the message over every output now obviously as an exercise to the viewer I invite you to work out where you put these missing things. So where would you put error reporting, for example, and maybe a sleep between retries? Because obviously if, if a message fails, then you don't want to just like busily send it a million times a second. And also, how would you escape that infinite loop if um, if the message never is going to get sent over an output, for example? Um, and obviously metrics and logging and stuff like that. Um, so there's a couple of broker examples. You might be wondering how round robin works. Um, round robin is stupidly simple we know which output is the next target we read a transaction we send the transaction as it is to that output and that's it um, it's not even worth drawing it's so trivial um, let's look at processes so a processor does all kinds of different things in benthos so these are these are almost like a function that you can specify in config you can specify as many as you want and you can obviously associate with a particular input a particular output or you can put it in its own processing layer where you can lock it to a certain number of threads um, and they do all kinds of weird things to messages coming through so they can create batches or break batches down and like I mentioned before, you can do transformations, so you can change the metadata based on the contents of a message. You can also do the other way around, you can change the contents based on metadata. You can do things like compression and archiving and also encoding in either direction. Um, you can do arbitrary JSON mutations, this uses like James Path queries, very similar to JQ syntax. Do grok, filtering, um, I won't get through the list. Um, but the way this works is you specify a list of processes and they have to be applied to each message in the order that you list them. So in order to get parallelism, um, what we do is we create a processor pipeline thread um, for every thread that you want to utilize and each one um, so for example imagine we've got a processor layer with where we're locking it to two threads we end up with two processing pipeline threads and each one goes through every processing step um, one at a time um, on the messages that come through and then eventually if we've got a message at the end of the stages we send that down the transactions channel and then we forget about it we grab the next one um, there's also a possibility that we have a filter somewhere in this list of processes and in which case what we would do is we read the message give it to the processor next one next one if that one filters it and we end up with nothing on the output we send a response back immediately and the processes themselves have the ability to specify when they've dropped a message whether we should acknowledge it or whether we're dropping it because something failed in which case Obviously, we say we still send a response back, but the response could be, "Oh, we kind of messed up here. We might, you might want to send that message again or send it somewhere else." Um, and the code is very straightforward. So the interface is just this. So any processor implements the process message function, where it's given a message, um, and the message could be multiple parts. So this could be a message batch. Just think of messages in Benthos as a batch, um, but it could be a batch of size one which it usually is. Um, and then what you can do is you can send back um, either one or more messages back. So this could be a batch that you've broken down into multiple batches, um, or you send a response back. And the response should indicate whether or not you done goofed or whether you've intentionally removed the messages. 
Um, but if you've given it back more than one message, then you don't need to give it a response, obviously. Um, and this is what an implementation might look like. So this is a sample function. And what it does is it randomly samples messages coming through the pipeline. The way it does that is um, it generates a random float, checks that it's within a boundary. If it is, we drop the messages by returning nil messages and we give a response back. And the response is an acknowledgement um, just to say, yep, we've dealt with this message. Don't go looking for it in the woods. Um, otherwise, uh, what we do is we send back a slice of size one uh, with the original contents because, you know, we're just sending it as it is. Very straightforward. Um, now, the thread, so the Go routine that's actually executing these processes is a little bit more complicated because obviously every processor um, takes a single message batch, but it could potentially return more. And then it could also be followed by more processes. So what we do is we enter this loop. So we start off with a slice of resulting messages, which is initially the payload. We also keep a reference to the last response we receive. And what we do is we iterate all the processes as long as our resulting messages is um, a slice greater than zero. And what we do is we um, iterate every message in that slice, give it to the current processor we're looking at. Um, so imagine we've got three uh, messages inside the resulting messages from the previous processor. Well, then the next processor will get each one in order. And then what we do is we keep, a, we keep track of what comes back um, as well as the last resort message to come back. And then the resort messages slice becomes that resulting slice from that processor. And obviously if that runs out, then whichever processor is the one that dropped the last message is the one that gives us back our response. Um, otherwise we just keep churning through them and eventually we get to the last processor and we end up with a result. Um, which then gets sent on. Now, also another thing that has to happen here is because we've got potentially multiple batches um, at the end of this processing step, this worker is responsible for sending all of those batches out in, um, at the same time. So they all go out in parallel um, and then we wait for responses back and we'll just retry them in a loop. So obviously we enter the same kind of logic as um, any other component that does retries where we'll retry over a certain period. We don't just do it busily as quickly as we can we do like sleeps and things and also we do like logging metrics and give you the mechanism to um, back out of retries if you if you need to um so that's how benthos processes work so you specify those in config they're all static they exist they are what they are um but you might want to create your own processes and use benthos essentially as a stream processing service with your processor in the middle of it um, which you can do and i've tried to make this api really nice and straightforward so let's take a look at that so let's start off with a really basic example. Let's say we've got this really simple Benthos pipeline that we want to build, uh, where we've just got a single Kafka consumer um, as our input, and we have a single processing thread with just a single processor in it, and then we want to write out to a Kafka topic um, just the same. And that's it. Um, but what we want to do is rather than having a Benthos processor, we want to have our own custom processor implementation. And let's say our processor is one where we want to filter out messages with our own custom filter. So what you do is you implement the process message interface. And if this processor is going to be stateless, then you can just um, implement this on an empty struct. You don't need to save anything. Um, and what we do here is in this message function. So firstly, we create a new message, which is going to be our result. And then what we do is we iterate every message part of the batch we've been given. So remember that every message is a batch. So what we do is we iterate all the contents of that batch. And for every message part, we check whether its contents contains the phrase, don't drop this damn message. And if it does contain that, what we do is we append a copy of that message part, which is just a shallow copy, um, to our resulting message. And then that loop eventually ends. And what we do is we check whether the result we've just created is empty. And if it is, that means we filtered out every single message within that batch, in which case we can just return a nil response with a, an acknowledgement. And the acknowledgement just basically says, yep, we dealt with this. Um, otherwise, if there is contents inside our result, then we send back a slice and the result is the only contents. We've just got one message batch on the result um, and then a null response. And that's it. That's all our implementation has to do. It just creates a new thing and then send it back or gives an acknowledgement back. Now, in order to construct the Benthos pipeline, we've got some options. So if we wanted to do this 100% programmatically, so imagine we're always going to be reading from Kafka, we're always writing to Kafka. There's no point necessarily making this config driven. Uh, what we can do is we can just create a stream config. So stream is the Benthos package to create an entire pipeline that includes inputs, um, an optional buffer, processing pipelines, and an output. And what we do is we specify that our input type is going to be Kafka. 
we give it the address to look for, we give it a topic, and then what we do is we say our output type is also Kafka, we give it the address, we give it the topic, um, and that could be our entire config. So what this will do is it will just create one input, one output. <coughs> it will create one processing pipeline with just one thread by default. Um, and then what we do is we say stream new. We give it that config. Um, and then what you do is you give it a uh, an option function. Um, and that is to add our own custom processes. Um, and this takes any number of constructors. So we give it a function to construct our custom processor. And the reason why we do that is because it automatically creates the number of threads we specify in our config. You don't have to worry about um, how many custom processes you have to build for that. It will automatically create as many as there are threads. Um, obviously, that means that it doesn't need to be thread safe because there's going to be one instance per thread. But you could, if you wanted to, create your custom processor elsewhere and in the constructor just return a reference to it, in which case it would need to be thread safe. Um, and then after that, we just check whether it gave an error back, which would usually be your config is duff, in which case panic, screw. Um, and then what we do is we defer uh, stopping the stream. So stop call will try uh, two things. So the first thing it tries is it tells the input layer to close itself and it waits for all the other components to gracefully come to a halt, in which case we know that we've flushed all the messages. Um, if it can't, if it doesn't do that in half the time you specify, then it goes on to the next step where it just tells every component in the pipeline to shut down, um, regardless of what it's doing. Then it waits for that to happen. Um, and if that hasn't happened by the time limit you specify here, then it just exits immediately and returns an error. And you can check it if you want. Um, basically, we just, we're just trying to close gracefully, but we don't have to necessarily. And then what you would put down here is some mechanism to keep your service open until some condition happens or like you get an exit signal or something like that. Now with this setup, what you could do is you could make the topic an environment variable and you could make the address of an environment variable. And that's it, that's all you need. You could just deploy this somewhere. Um, there's other options on the stream API for setting metrics and logging and stuff like that, which obviously I would recommend you do if you're creating a service. Um, and all of those are components in, in Benthos that you can just grab. They can also be config driven as well. All that good stuff. Now, let's say we had a more complicated setup. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to read from a number of Kafka partitions, which we don't necessarily know when we're, when we're writing our um, stream service. <clears throat> and we want to process across a number of processing pipelines. And again, we want to make the threads here configurable because we don't know how many threads we're going to have until we deploy. Um, and then finally, we want to write all of that out to a, a Kafka topic. And in our processing pipelines, we want to have multiple processes now because what we're going to get from these Kafka partitions is a, an, a Base64 encoded and a gzip compressed payload. So rather than writing those functions ourselves, because Benthos already has processes for those things, uh, we can just have a Benthos de decompress function followed by a Benthos decode processor. And then finally, we want to have our processor, which is the same filter I just showed you before at the end of that. So it might be smart in this case, because a lot of this pipeline is going to be dynamic. So the number of inputs, the number of processors, and maybe even the number of outputs, um, rather than hard coding the config for this, let's actually just read the config. So um, Benfoss natively supports YAML and JSON, which means you can just read the raw bytes of a YAML or JSON file, and then you can unmarshal that directly into a stream config, and it'll automatically create the um, config as, as it should be. Um, obviously, when you call new config, it's populated with smart defaults, so um, you don't even have to do any validation or anything like that on the um, config you give it. Um, and then what happens is we, we unmarshal our config um, based on this path, which you know could be a flag or something. Um, and then we do the same almost exact stream.new call as before. We just give it the config and we give it our processors. Um, and everything else is basically the same. So obviously, I would recommend doing logging and metrics again. Uh, but this would hypothetically mean you can compile this into a service and then deploy it. And the entire Benthos pipeline can be done with config. So your inputs... Um, the number of inputs, your processing threads, um, and also the processes that precede your custom processor. So I forgot to mention, whenever you um, call this add processes function, any custom processes you specify here will come after any Benthos processes that are configured in the service. So all we have to do in our config is specify uh, decompress and then decode, and your custom processor happens at the end of that. And this automatically gets created um, for as many threads as we've got, so we don't need to worry about threading when we're writing this service um, or anything like that. It's all going to be config driven. And this is what the config might look like. So 
I haven't really shown any examples in this um, presentation about Benthos config because it's there's other videos for that. Um, but here's like a quick example. So because we want multiple inputs, we say we want a broker input and that has an inputs array and we specify we just want a Kafka balanced input which automatically balances the number of partitions across the number of consumers that there are. And then we say we want three of these um, and that's it. And then we have a pipeline section where we say we want three threads and then we specify our decompress which is gzip by default but there's others if we needed. Um, and then decode which is base64 by default. Um, and then our custom processors would come after these. And then we see our output Kafka. Now if we decided we wanted multiple um, output um, Kafka's, we could just do a broker type on the output as well. It could all be configuration driven um, and you don't have to change any of your code or anything like that. You could also change the processes here. So if the format of payloads coming through the pipeline changes and you don't want to have to recompile your service, well you don't need to because that's all configuration driven. And there's a bunch of flexibility in the processes that Benthos offers. So a lot of trivial stream stuff that does change, you'll probably find there's a Benthos processor for dealing with that in config rather than you having to recompile the service. And that means your processor implementations can just be specialized in the specific thing you want to do which in this case is filtering junk um, and that's it so that's uh, that's all I want to show in this presentation um, thanks for watching hopefully you found that interesting uh, here's a cheeky link to the actual repo itself and also to the um, GoDocs page for the stream API if you want to check that out and write your own streams well I strongly encourage you to do that um, yeah that's it go away <laughs>